Hi, this is Professor Lapuma of the New Jersey Institute of Technology, recording for my technical communications course with material drawn from my text, Fundamentals of Undergraduate Education and Learning. What we're going to talk about today is specifically resume elements. So let's begin. So as you create your resume, what you really need to think about is that there are certain parts of it which are grouped together. And without looking into the actual content, when the person looks at your resume package, these graphical elements will draw people to see things grouped together. They're connected or clumped. And it is these elements that we want you to build first so that you can interchange them. And there are often levels of connection that you build in. So we're going to talk a little bit first about some of the things that you need to do. Now, as you create your elements, you have to realize that each element you create must be relevant and impressive. When we say relevant, we mean that what you put on your resume has to connect to the job you seek or to the situation you're going to be interviewing in or using the resume for. And then impressive means that sometimes you have material which isn't directly connected to that job, but you feel it will impress your target about you. So you'll put on activities and accomplishments that may not be directly connected to the job, but that you can then talk about and impress the person with your experience. Your resume's job is to deliver that material in an easy to read way so that they can successfully access it, understand it, and act on it. Now, there are lots of different people that will talk to you about a lot of different formats for resumes and styles and things like that. I am only giving you my perspective, which is designed for students at a university in America seeking a job for the first time or to go on to graduate school. If you're a tenure professional in a company, there's probably a different format. If you're going to submit it online rather than at a career fair or with a cover letter, it's probably a different format. But in the end, my ideas here are meant to help you create a readable, easily accessible, relevant, and impressive resume that uses the basic elements of technical communication to create a clear, easily accessible resume. So one of the things that we want to think about is that as you format your elements and as you put the material on, it all should be formatted similarly. But it has to be emphasized differently. And it's this use of emphasis that makes the difference. And usually when we say formatted similarly, you use a fairly standard margin on the whole thing. You use a fairly standard font size and style on the whole thing. But that doesn't mean that every font is the same. As you have more information, your font may get smaller. One of the cardinal problems that students do when they want to make their resume fit on the page because they have too much, they shrink the whole thing or they increase the margins. On the other side, if they don't have enough to say, they expand the margin so that they're one and a half all around or they make the, all the fonts bigger. And that's not what you want to do. Every little part of your resume can be adjusted so that you can change the space. And as we go into this, we'll talk about this more, but right, white space and graphics can have different font sizes, can have different italics and bolding. And so it's these little things that we want to talk about. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit about some of the basic differences that we want to talk. Now, one of the things we say is that usually when we talk about emphasis, the first thing that will change emphasis is this idea of centering something versus having it on the margin or indented. Usually your heading is centered. But even within that, there are many different kinds of emphasis that students use on their resume which make things harder to read and often draw attention to them. So at a baseline, bolding is the first thing, right? And most of your fonts should be either in plain text or bolded. And that's a basic difference. Sometimes you will use italics to connect to what you're doing. And then other times you'll use both bold and italics. And these first four things, horizontal spacing and vertical spacing in a lesser extent, but horizontal spacing, plain text, bolding, italics, and bold italics are the things you should use most commonly. On the rarest of occasions, you may also want to use uppercase Sometimes, though I have seen almost no opportunity to use it on most college resumes, bold and uppercase. Some students go too far and use bold uppercase with italics or underlined. 
you are then putting five or six levels of emphasis, especially in the modern world where all caps has become yelling, it's not a good idea. But more importantly, it makes it harder to read your resume because the natural caps lowercase flow of wording is gone. So please be careful not to do that. Now, one other thing that a lot of students have is that they want to see the difference between script and italics. And so what they're saying is, well, it's, it's not italics, it's a script font. They actually change the font. I will leave this up to you. I personally do not like script fonts because they don't always come through if you send them electronically. And when you're copying, they sometimes have troubles. I like the Times New Roman font as a base font because it's safe and clear. And we'll go into a little bit more about that later. But again, the choice is always yours. And you can see just by making these little basic things of emphasis, even though the font size is all the same for all of these, just by changes, you add and reduce the amount of space that your things take horizontally and vertically. So now we're going to do a little bit more about this idea of font. And one of the things I want to show you is the difference very clearly about Times New Roman and Arial, which are probably the two most commonly used ones. Times New Roman is a serif font. Arial is a sans serif font. And all that means is that the little tick marks at the end are there in a serif font and are not there in a sans serif font. But when you do this, one of the things is that it becomes harder to read. And often people say an Arial font, besides being harder to read, is seeming less professional. But if you look at the the section here, you can see that between regular and bolded, for the same amount of letters, you can fit more information in if you use a unbolded Times New Roman than an unbolded Arial font. Arial font spreads the letters a little bit more. For some people, that's what they want. That's great. One of the more important things is if you look at the difference between italics in a Times New Roman font and italics in an Arial font, you can actually take italics and bolding much more clearly in the Times New Roman font, in my opinion. It doesn't always work. When you put them both together, you can see that a Times New Roman bolded font with italics is almost two letters smaller than an Arial font. These kinds of things are important in your resume as you get more information. Instead of making Arial in a smaller size, which is harder to read, use Times New Roman, which is a tighter, clearer font, and you can use a larger font instead of a smaller font, which is always better. Better to say less in a larger, clearer font. As a rule of thumb, start with 12, reduce the less important things to 11, and if, if you have to, make everything 11 and the less important things to 10. You should try never to go below 10 because they can't read it very clearly and not copy it. And never put anything on your resume below 9. People cannot read below 7. So we want to go a little bit more forward into the basic headings. Now, there's a fairly common thing that we all want to put in our headings. Our name, our address, our phone number, and of course, our email address. This is basic. And what I've given here are three different styles. As you need more room, you can begin to compress things up. Some people like to do this because they have two or three phone numbers. They have more than one email. They have a web address that they want to include, a URL. So those kinds of things can be added. You can make it two or three columns, however you want to do it. One thing that's very important, and for some reason students like to do this, and I don't know why, they put phone followed by their phone number if you need to say home versus cell, that's fine, but you have to assume that your target is going to know that it's a phone number. I don't understand why anyone would put email colon and then their email address. In this modern world, most people realize that when you put something at, say, njit.edu, that that's an email address. And so you don't really have to worry about that that much. If you feel that they can't figure that out, then you probably shouldn't include that on your resume because if they can't figure out that it's your, your address at njit.edu, then it's not really worth doing. Now, one thing that you want to realize is that these three different things are fine, and there's many other ways. Some people want to put their name very large on the left and have space on the right for a, a business card or information or use a letterhead. The key here is that your 
Heading information is your contact information, and it's set off usually in the center so that they can quickly see who you are, and if they already know who you are, they can quickly discard it and only refer to it if needed. Sometimes people like their name very large, and so they'll use this bottom one in which they've put their name bolder and larger in the center. That's fine. Again, some people use that middle space for third file of information. It really depends on how much you have to say. Now, what we want to do here is bring up a sample, but before we do that, NJIT, the university I work for, has a career development services department, and what they've done is, on this webpage, listed a lot of their resources, so if you want, you can go to this website, and it's http colon slash slash www.njit.edu slash cds slash resource center slash resume.php. I'm sorry, that's resumes with an S dot PHP. And you can follow this link and find more resources. I do not claim that all of them are good, but at least this page gives you a basic information about the elements that should be on your resume and how to do it. But for us, what I want to do now is leave PowerPoint and actually go into Microsoft Word and look at a sample, simple resume. Now, what you'll begin to see is at the bottom, as I click on something, you can see the font size. Right? So for this resume, I used an 18-point font for the header and a 12 for everything else. And I used a bar to separate out my header contact information from the body. Now, if I zoom out without actually having to be able to read anything, you can quickly identify where I have major categories with subcategories. You can identify where I have um, something of importance because it's bolded. You can identify bold and italics. It's not easy to see, but from a very far away thing, you can see that my page is broken fairly clearly. I have uniform margins all the way around. This is intended to be for someone who is at school, somewhere in the middle. Now, as we move closer, you can begin to identify the major elements that they have. So header information separated out by a thing, an objective, and then education and experience. And these are probably the three most common elements that everyone will have. Now, when we say objective, what you really want to talk about is something, again, not in a full sentence, written out in a way that explains the position you want, in the field that you want, and when you're available. So in this case, it's simply to obtain a summer internship in electrical engineering for the summer of that time. Some people will include other things in this if they have space, such as seeking a management position with advancement opportunities, or with leadership abilities, or so things like that. But in the event that you don't know those things, it's better to say less. Do not put anything about what you will get. Don't say, I want a job so I can gain experience to work for somebody else. Right? The less you say, the better. You don't always need an objective, but in many cases, the objective is helpful for you to know what we're doing. Now, one thing I'd like you to see is that here, the font size, again, is 12, but if you needed to make space, you can actually take your font size in these interspaces and make them smaller, as I did here between the line and my objective. I made this a 5. It still leaves a white space, but the white space is smaller. Right? The next thing you'll notice is that I made New Jersey Institute of Technology bolded, but then I made this bold and italic. And so as you build these things, you can see that these kinds of ideas, right, if I make them bold and italic, sets this apart from this one so that you see what I have. Now, one thing that's important as I put together my experience, I included this idea of the fact that this has a date on it. And then I have an internship and a date on it, and a date on it. And these things connect what we're doing. And some of the ideas here is that some people will want to put an extra return between internships because they want it to be a separate heading. Other people will leave it as experience in which this one is a work experience, and then this one is a unpaid experience or an internship. So then as we go down further, we have other headings. Because there's still room on the page, we want to give the opportunity to say other things. So we can put computers, we can put volunteering, we can put references, we can put honors. The idea here is that I put them in the order that I felt were what would be wanted by my target. Suppose you're going for a computer position, maybe computers are more important. Perhaps you have some other heading that's important, projects. Other people feel their volunteering is most important, so they put that at the top.
At the bottom, to show we've reached the end of the resume, you want to put references available upon request. Please do not include a list of references. If they're interested in you, you want them to contact you, not some other person to talk about you. Also, unless you contact the person who you're giving the reference to before you go on the interview and say, get ready, when you are contacted for references, it gives you the opportunity to call that person, meet that person, whatever, and prepare them for the call they're going to to get. You want to make sure that they can hear you and know what you have to say. So this completes our basic understanding of elements. Thank you.